Uh, if you've been walking with us for any length of time, we've been studying the book of the Bible called the book of Hebrews. We, as, uh, as a church, we work through books of the Bible. Now, we'll be starting a new book of the Bible at some point this year. I'm trying to get it done by Easter, the book of Hebrews. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, you know me, I like to pontificate on things and really expand them way beyond you need to. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully, Lord willing, we'll be done with Hebrews by Easter. But we'll have a new book of the Bible to uh, start after, after Easter, Lord willing. Um, but for now, we're going to be kind of finishing up uh, Hebrews chapter 11. The book of Hebrews is uh, written to a, a small little church in the middle of the first century. Uh, they're uh, facing a lot of popular uh, oppression and also political suppression. And so the whole purpose for this church was to encourage the believers not to shrink back from the culture that was coming against them. I mean, even as we've seen with these uh, kids moment videos, the culture was constantly coming against Paul or Peter or Apollos on the message of the gospel all the time. And we certainly live in a time in which that is also true today. This book called Hebrews is meant to be a comfort as it struggled against these things. But it was a reminder that Christ is Lord over all things. Christ is Lord was one of the greatest political statements of subversion that the Roman government could ever understand. In rejecting Caesar as Lord, putting Christ as Lord over all things. So this letter to the Hebrews is focusing on the supremacy of Christ over all things, and that he's working all things according to his will, and that he will never abandon his church, but he would give them ultimate victory over their enemies, just as he had ultimate victory over sin, Satan, and death, and inaugurated the new creation, which we get to participate in now, in part, by the Holy Spirit and his church. In the book of Hebrews so far, the writer has reminded us that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that was promised in the Old Testament, and the true reality of the different types and the kinds that we see kind of prefigured and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. That's why there's a lot of discussion with some of these different figures like Abraham and Moses and Aaron and Melchizedek and uh, all, a bunch of other people. That Jesus is the true reality of what is prefigured and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. This is another reminder for the church that they are holding fast to the truth because there was a lot of pressure to either go back, right, to conform to the culture or to go back to the old ways of worship and to abandon Christ. We today still face that temptation to go back or to conform to the culture. So the church is being exhorted to press forward into the culture, not shrink back from it. That's the end of Hebrews chapter 10 but to bring the gospel, which is the ultimate answer for all things. It's not just the answer for my soul, but the gospel has something to say about every aspect of human life. Every single aspect of human life, the gospel has an answer for it. It has the best answer for it. This is something that we must not shrink back from. This kind of pressing in with the truth of the Bible and the gospel is called faith by the writer here at the very beginning of chapter 11. The writer is going on to list a lot of different people in the Old Testament that witnessed this kind of not shrinking back faith. Called, sometimes Hebrews 11 is called the hall of faith. You know, you've got these you know, different figures, men and women, uh, that the author really kind of uh, highlights. But the reality is they're just like us. You know, sometimes their lives are train wrecks, yet they still witnessed the truth of the gospel. They still witnessed to the world the power of God. So, as we finish up Hebrews 11 this next couple of weeks, we're going to be taking a look at stories of some of these individuals. Now, as we take a look in a moment, uh, the writer sort of uh, very quickly goes through a, kind of a list of people. Um, and the assumption for the writer is that the readers know every single one of these names and the story of every single one of these names. And so when they talk about people like David, or Samuel, or Samson. The readers can understand already the story and how this is connected to a life of faith. I don't know if we necessarily, in 21st century American culture, have that same kind of ability. I think Bible literacy in especially this city is extremely low. So I think it would be really unkind of me just to run through these names without giving any kind of context Part of my job as a pastor, right, is also to teach God's Word, 
right? Not just to preach and push it in to our minds and our souls, but also to teach. And so, you know, uh, these names of the people we'll see in a minute, they are just wonderful stories, beautiful things that we can learn about faith and trust and pressing in and not shrinking back. So with that kind of a background, that's why I've titled my sermon, Faith in Action. This is the fifth installment kind of of our Faith in Action sort of series as we take a look at Hebrews 11. But let's go ahead and stand in the honor of reading of God's word. This is Hebrews 11, 32 to 40. But we're focusing just really on the first couple of names that we have listed here. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together, and then we'll dive right in. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. First two guys that I'm going to take a look at here is Gideon and Barak. Um, but I'm actually going to go in reverse order here, Barak, then Gideon, partly because uh, the first several names here, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, they are found in the book called Judges. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, the Judges were a period of time in Israel's history where, you know, the, the wilderness generation had died off. Now they're coming into the land of promise, the land of Canaan that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now they're going into this land, and they're having these military battles to settle in the land. This is a period before the kings. This is a period when God really was the king of the nation of Israel. So at times, God would raise up a person to lead a military victory against their enemies. These were called judges. Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah are four judges that we're going to take a look at in a minute. Well, Barak isn't technically a judge. We'll see in a moment. But um, these are not in chronological order. The rest so far of Hebrews 11 has been largely in chronological order, starting with Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, then Moses, of course. We finished uh, a couple weeks ago, or I guess maybe six weeks ago probably through the Advent, uh, speaking about Rahab and Jericho. So far, it's been in chronological order, but here, it's not in chronological order. As you read through the book of Judges, Barak comes first. So that's who we're going to start with now, is Barak. His story can be found in Judges verses four, uh, chapters 4 and 5. Barak is the man who trusted God's word and accepted the role that God had for him. This is how Judges chapter 4 starts. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harsheth Hagoyim. Say that ten times fast. So this is very typical of the book of Judges. If you guys think about the book of Judges, if you haven't read it yet, you can think of the word cycles over and over and over again. The people fall into evil, doing either what was right in their own eyes or doing what was right in, or wrong and evil in the Lord's eyes. Both of these phrases are used over and over and over again in the book of Judges. They fall into sin. God brings a nation in to discipline and correct his people. He raises up a military figure to deliver them from these enemies and to restore the right worship of the Lord. These are the period of the Judges. So here is the state of Israel, again, doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. God brings this enemy judge, or this enemy army, led by a man named Sisera, uh, to oppress God's people. And then here's what we have soon after that. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, 
and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I'll draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I'll give them into your hand. Barak said to her, I will go if you go with me, I will go. But if I will not go, uh, if, if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road in which you're going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So here you have this really interesting sort of a relationship. You have Deborah, who is a prophetess. She's got this very intimate relationship with the Lord, and she's in, in judging Israel. She's giving them judgment for different situations and circumstances. She, as a prophetess, knows that Barak has now been summoned by the Lord to lead the men in a military battle against their enemies. So he comes to her and he listens to her and says, hey, as long as you're going with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. Why? Well, she's a prophetess. Her presence is bringing the presence of the Lord. He's trusting that if God is with them, there is nothing they can't do. And one of the things that we see in Judges, we don't have here uh, this morning, but one of the things we have in Judges is Sisera's army was absolutely incredible. They rivaled the same kind of army of Egypt that was driving the two million Israelites toward the Red Sea. I mean, this was, this was not a small army. So even though we see 10,000 people here, that was really nothing compared to what they really needed to actually drive out this army that had settled in the land. Barak listened to Deborah, and they ended up having this very successful campaign to drive out the enemies of Israel. Now, one of the interesting stories that we have here is that Sisera, remember, he's the general here, the enemy general, ends up fleeing the battle scene, ends up running away as his people are getting cut down and decimated, ends up hiding in a tent of a woman named Jael, and she ends up giving him water, you know, he ends up taking a little nap uh, in, in her tent, you know. Uh, he falls asleep, and then Jael, she takes this long spike, this tent peg, right? And she drives it through his temple into the ground. That's intense. <laughs> Get it? Intense? Dad jokes 2022 all day, baby. <laughs> A dad of four, all right? Come on, you got to give me that. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, she, this is where the glory was, right? I mean, really, Barak should have had that glory, right? As the man leading the army, seeing the army decimated, should have had the glory of actually destroying the enemy general. And yet, he didn't. It was Jael. These two women, Deborah and Jael, played the key roles of leadership and courage for God's people. But why is Barak mentioned in Hebrews 11, but not Deborah and not Jael in the book of Hebrews. It's kind of interesting. We have here, these men are, are mentioned. I mean, he's mentioned other women, right? The writer of the book of Hebrews has mentioned other women. Uh, so far, we have, of course, Sarah and Rahab, so it's not like he's ignoring women. I wonder why this is. Well, as you read Judges chapter 4 and 5, this story reads really as a cohesive whole. Both men and women here together are accomplishing what God had called them to do to drive out the enemies and restore right worship. So while Barak, as the man representing the army, is highlighted here in Hebrews 11, it certainly was not without the leadership and the courage of the women in his life. Judges chapter 5 is a, this wonderful song uh, that Deborah and Barak together end up singing, recounting the deeds of the Lord through Barak and Deborah and Jael. It's an interesting note. Uh, a lot of Bible scholars have posited that the reason why Deborah was sitting as a judge instead of a man was because there was no qualified man to, uh, to sit as judge over Israel at that time. I don't think it's any kind of uh, surprise for you guys to know that the Lord uh, has set up the nation of Israel as a patriarchy, which is not a four-letter word, contrary to some popular belief. Because we see that God has established loving, servant, male leadership in the nation. And especially for the head of the home, head of the church. 
That's the, the model that God has established for his people for human thriving. But what's mentioned, or not mentioned perhaps in Judges 4 and 5, is there is no mention at all that there were no qualified men to sit as judge over Israel. It's never mentioned in the book of Judges. That's why I partially reject that. This wasn't some kind of second string leadership. This wasn't kind of second best, oh, we've got this lady over here, I guess you'll do. That's not what it is at all. I disagree with that assessment for a lot of reasons. Again, there's no mention that there were no qualified men in Israel to judge. And here's the second thing. As you guys actually read the book of Judges, there's no qualification to sit as judge at all. There's no qualification. I mean, some of the people, we're going to take a look at Samson next week, some of the people are just train wrecks of lives. You know, so we're thinking about like what's quali- who's qualified to sit as judge. God's sovereign decision is to sit as judge over Israel. God's sovereign decision. He chooses a person for his own purpose and he uses them despite their inadequacies and mistakes to deliver his people and to renew the right worship. The third reason I reject that is because uh, a judge is different than a priest or a prophet or a king, which are traditionally held by men in Israel, certainly. It should not come as a surprise that God can and does use women in all kinds of roles to lead and to strengthen his people. I would just consider how we took a look at the women of Advent, for instance, many ways that God uses women to do that. After all, we are created in the image of God, are we not? Equal in dignity and value before God. Created male and female to complement one another for the human thriving and to bring glory and honor to God. We're not the same, however. I think that's very obvious. We don't have the same abilities to do the same things. I cannot give birth, for instance. Nor would you want me to give birth. I'd probably complain about it all the time. But we're created in unique ways. Ways that are intended for the flourishing of the human race. I believe the beauty about Deborah and Barak, I believe the beauty of this is a relationship of trust. He trusted her. The word that God was bringing to the nation through her, he trusted that. She trusted him to actually accomplish the military victory. This was born out of the faith that Barak demonstrated in the person God chose to lead and judge the nation at the time, regardless of their gender. So how is this connected to faith with Barak? I believe that faith can see the bigger picture of what God is doing. Faith can see the larger picture of what is happening and uh, what God is doing and submits to it participates in it, regardless of the role that we give. God has called all of us to serve in a particular role in his church, in his kingdom. And that's not all going to be the same. But it's all meant to bring honor and glory to God. Barak doesn't seek his own glory. Remember, she even said that the glory would be given to a woman, not to you. He wasn't seeking his own glory. But he sought to only obey the word of God. That's why I say Barak is the man who trusted God's word. That's Barak. Next, we'll get to Gideon. And Gideon's a little bit of a longer story. That's why we'll be finishing with Gideon today. Uh, it's, it's a bit more going on here. Gideon, his story can be found in Judges chapter 6 through 8. So if you get a chance, maybe later today, uh, you can go to Judges chapter 4 to 8, kind of read those, and those will be the stories of Barak and Gideon. Here's how uh, Gideon's story really begins in Judges chapter 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them to the hand of Midian seven years. There it is again. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Remember, cycles. (laughs) They remember that this is going to be a consistent pattern of the nation throughout the book of Judges. And I think this really, uh, in many ways, an example of our own relationship and faith with the Lord, right? I mean, We're not always constantly growing in faith and trust. There are many times where we doubt, we become afraid, we wander away from the Lord or from his people. We don't take seriously the call to study God's word, to be time in prayer, to be time in fellowship with the saints. I mean, there are times we wander away, and the Lord does something oftentimes in our life to bring us back to him. You know, take a look at Hebrews 12, but that's called God's correction and his discipline, and it's a loving thing of a loving father to keep his children close to him. It's not uh, an abusive father. 
Gideon was a man whom God chose to deliver the Israelites from the hand of the Midianites. Okay, so as you read uh, Judges 6 through 8, you'll see that he's the man that God chose. Now, we'll get to this in a moment, uh, but the, the kind of person that Gideon was, he was a man who was a coward with a capital C. Just an absolute coward. I will get into that in a moment. Why would God choose a coward to deliver his people from the Midianites? Well, the Midianites didn't just oppress the Israelites militarily like they did with Barak and Deborah. The Midianites were more insidious. They brought a false worship also to bear in the nation of Israel. Brought false gods that the people of Israel wholesale accepted and began to worship the false gods of the Midianites. This was the state of Israel at the time. They were worshiping these false gods, both of the Midianites and the Amorites. And who were these false gods? Baal and Asherah. These are specifically mentioned in Judges chapter 6. The way that Baal and Asherah, who were the gods of fertility and sex, that they were worshipped, that they had these poles. They were phallic in nature all over the nation. You can imagine the ways in which the false gods were worshipped with these certain practices, these rituals. Anywhere that you see Baal or Asherah mentioned in the Bible, it is always condemned by the Lord. Not just because it's false worship, right, of a false god that's bad enough. But Baal and Asherah worship, the sex cults, they were abominations to the Lord because they twisted and corrupted God's good natural orders of creation into something hideous and twisted. So before that Gideon can be the man that actually brings a military victory over the Midianites, God's first order of business for Gideon is to go through the land and to cut down these poles, and then to build an altar to the Lord, establishing right worship. Because God knows it's one thing to have an external sort of cleansing. It's a different thing altogether to have an internal cleansing of God's people. They need, their hearts need to be turned back to the Lord before the external cleansing of the Midianites could be established because they could still leave, but that sickness would still be inside. So the first order of business, God calls Gideon to get some guys and to go and cut down the poles of Asherah and Baal. Then to make an altar to the Lord, to sacrifice, you know, a sacrifice of atonement, confessing the sins of the people and calling the people to repent. That must have been way more scary to Gideon than leading the men in a military victory, right? Because he's calling out the sins of society. That's my job, right, to call out the sins of our society. I think it's probably no surprise that our society is obsessed with sex. Are we surprised? Did I just say something crazy here? No. The sex trade, the sex industry, pornography, I mean, it is rampant. It is everywhere, and it is evil. Carl Truman, in his book, describes pornography. He says, pornography might therefore be described as blasphemous in the manner in which it desecrates the holy and tramples on sacred authority. In short, the major problem with pornography is not what, man, uh, not what many religious conservatives might understand it to be. It's promotion of lust and it's objectifying of the participants. It certainly does both of those things, but the problem is much deeper. It repudiates any notion that sex has significance beyond the act itself, and therefore it rejects any notion that is emblematic of a sacred order. Emblematic of a sacred order. The glorification of sex and body image in our popular consciousness. Think about how much time people spend at the gym. How much time they spend obsessing over their body image. And people are more loyal to their gym than they are to their churches. We've lost the old order of cultivating virtue in our own lives. And instead of cultivating our body image. The normalization and glorification of transgenderism in the gay community. It's a twisting and a corrupting of God's good natural order. Separating of sex from its proper and good context, which is a marriage covenantal context. We are a nation who are worshiping Baal and Asherah 
sacrificing, twisting, and corrupting. We need to call our people to repent, to come back to the Lord. We're living in a time, I believe, of Gideon. We need to go through and cut down and reestablish the right worship of the Lord, submitting to his good, natural, right orders that are meant for human thriving, not just giving us things and ways to live just to arbitrarily. It's meant for human thriving. And it does bring an honor and glory to God. This is Gideon. He's called to do this. The second order of business, after he goes and does this, now that the hearts of the people are being brought back to the Lord, now that they're repenting of their sin, now that they're worshiping the Lord, what's next? Now they can drive out, now they can drive out the Midianites. God calls Gideon to raise up an army. And he does. He's very successful in doing it. He's got thousands of men that are rallying to the cry to drive out this enemy nation. And yet, in God's sovereign plan, the thousands of people were too many. And if you guys know this story, it's very familiar. There was a process of winnowing. God takes thousands of men and winnows it down through a different process to just 300 fighting men. I think people like this part of the story of Gideon because it reminds us of like 300, you know, Sparta. It's like, yeah. You forget about the Baal and Asherah stuff. Easy to forget that stuff. We don't need to be called out on our sin. But yeah, let's get 300 men and go fight. But what's crazy is they didn't actually fight. God ends up creating this really devious little scheme where they would surround the Midianite army. They had a lamp in one hand that was covered by a jar and a sword in the other hand. At the right time, in the middle of the night, God calls them to smash the jars, hold up their torch, and scream out loud. The Midianites look around. It looks like there's bonfires everywhere, you know, tens and tens of thousands of Israelites. And so they freak out, and they fight and kill each other. Gideon and the men don't even lay a hand. <laughs> they literally watch the Midianite army destroy itself. The Lord had sent his spirit to go and to confuse the Midianites. It's a wonderful, uh, I think, really a description that God saves his people. That no matter how big the army, no matter how insidious they are, no matter what comes against God's people, and no matter how, to, how small the army of the Lord is, with the Lord is victory. It comes across very clearly in this story with Gideon. And he does this. The third order of business, God's not done yet with Gideon, is to go through the land of Israel and to unite all the tribes together back into one identity of the nation of Israel under the covenant of God. And here's the end of Gideon's story in Judges 8. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. Forty years of rest and peace under Gideon. Driving out the, idol, the idolatry of the nation, then removing the external threat, then bringing unity with the nation. And as I mentioned, the man that God chose was a capital C coward. He was a man that was hiding from the enemies. When the Lord actually begins to address Gideon, every time the Lord came to Gideon, Gideon doubted that it was God and asked for a sign that it was really him. The first time God comes, Gideon says, uh, I want confirmation that's really you, Lord, because I don't know. I don't know about this business. The second time he asks is the famous one, right, where he gives a little fleece, right? He sends out a fleece. Hey, Lord, if, if you want me to actually lead this military campaign, I want to guarantee that it's going to be successful. So make the fleece wet and the, you know, the ground around it dry, and I'll know that it's from you. God does that. He condescends to his doubt. Second time, says, okay, Lord, that was great. Let's reverse it now. Okay, let's make the fleece dry and the ground wet around it. Now I'll know that you're going to be really with me. The Lord again condescends to his doubt and says, okay. And he does it. Then when actually they go to the enemy army, 
Gideon is still doubting, still afraid that they're going to fail, still afraid they're not going to actually succeed in this plan that God had given him and the multiple times of confirmation he's already given him. So God preemptively tells Gideon, hey, I know that you're you know, kind of worried about this. So if you are worried, why don't you take you know, your servant here, Pura, and you know, go down and eavesdrop on the enemies and just hear what they're going to say because I think you might be encouraged by what they're saying. So Gideon said, all right, I am afraid. So he goes and takes his servant, Pura, and they go down to the army at night and they're listening uh, to the enemy soldiers. And the enemy soldiers are afraid. And they're relating this dream that they've all been having that the Israelites are going to successfully drive them away. So Gideon's like, oh, sweet. All right, if the enemy is already afraid, if they already kind of feel like they're going to be defeated, then yeah. I mean, my goodness, Gideon is racked with fear. He's racked with doubt. He continues to ask over and over and over again. And yet, here's what the Lord sees with Gideon. Judges chapter 6, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. This is the first time that the Lord comes to Gideon. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Interesting. Here is Gideon's response. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. He's kind of, you know, going back and forth here with the Lord. Gideon was in a wine press, which at that time a wine press was dug beneath the ground. He was hiding in this big wine press, and he was trying to thresh his wheat. So you take the wheat, you throw it in the air, the chaff blows away with the wind, the good stuff falls to the ground, but you're in a wine press below the ground. Is there any kind of wind going on at all? No. He's not actually threshing his wheat. He's hiding from the enemy. And this is where the Lord says, you are a man of valor. You have might. Go and lead my people. It's amazing. Judges 7, the night before the Lord would end up giving victory, so the, the same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I've given it into your hand. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. So what, are, what can we learn about faith and trust from Gideon? Well, the first thing is that faith is grounded in God's declaration about who I am. It's grounded in God's declaration about who I am. Not about how I want to define myself or how I think I should define myself to be. It's in what God has declared you to be. And if you're in Christ, he's declared you to be a saint. He's declared you to be his child. That's what you are. You may not feel like a saint. You may not feel like a child. But you are in Christ. God casts a vision for Gideon about who he was and what he would become. And faith holds that declaration before our eyes and lets that declaration determine my status and determine who I truly am and how to live and how to act. That. Also, faith at times, it does need or require a bit more confirmation, right? Because we are humans and we easily forget and we easily doubt. God does bring confirmation. He condescends to give us confirmation when our faith is weak. He doesn't reject Gideon for Gideon asking these questions. He doesn't reject Gideon because Gideon keeps asking for confirmation. He condescends. I think for us, as Christians, the greatest confirmation that we have or need that God will be our God no, he'll always be with us, that he'll always protect us, always provide for us, take care of us. The greatest confirmation is found in the cross of Jesus Christ, friends. We don't need to do the Gideon fleece, asking for these weird signs and confirmations. We have it already. The clearest declaration is found at the cross. 
We simply look to the cross to find the surest and strongest confirmation of God's covenant commitment to us. I think we can also learn that faith can accomplish great things for the Lord and oftentimes surprise us in how God allows us to participate in such a great work. He was the youngest of the smallest clan. I mean, there was nothing in himself as a person that would necessarily lend him to great her, you know, acts of heroism. You might feel like that in your own life. And yet God has called us to this immense, glorious work of the gospel, the building up of his kingdom and the church. Each one of you, from the least to the greatest, is called into the same work. God had no idea, Gideon had no idea that God would use him the way that he did. It wasn't in his mind. And yet God did. Gideon didn't seek or aspire to greatness, or, you know, to be the deliverer of God's people. He was hiding in the wine press from the enemy when God came to him and called him to his work. So let's go ahead and, and conclude here. Faith, faith means that our whole lives, every square inch of it, is to be lived under Christ's rule and for his glory in the world. Second, faith means that I do not seek glory for myself, but for Christ alone, content to play the role that God brings into my life, knowing that they are for my good and designed ultimately for his glory. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, God, I thank you for these examples of men who trusted you, men who were just like us, fearful and doubting at times, And Lord, I thank you that you took them and you transformed them from fear to faith. Men who did wonderful acts, mighty acts of valor because of what you've called them to do. Lord Jesus, today, some of us might be wondering how you are calling us this year. I pray that you would help us to submit to the declaration that you have made over us, that you love us, that you are our God, that we are yours, that we are your saints, and that we are your children. Jesus, I ask that you would help us to keep that identity, that declaration in our hearts and our minds. I pray that it would influence how we live and how we act. I pray that it would be the lens by which I look at my year and determine what I'm going to do, where I'm going to be, and who I'm going to be. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you condescend to give us the greatest confirmation of your covenant commitment to us at the cross. Help us to look to the cross today, this week, and this year to continue to feast on your faithfulness, knowing that you're with us always. We pray all of these things, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen.